would be comprising of all the winners from cataract number one, two, three, and four. Sir, over to the chair. The winner of uh, this uh, semi-final would go to the Rangachari session. Uh, we call upon uh, Dr. Sayantan Ghosh from Cataract 1 uh, session winner. He'll be talking on 3D model simulation for surgical training versus conventional training. A very good afternoon, uh, my seniors and my dear colleagues. Today my paper would be on a concept paper on using 3D modeling to learn surgeries. I don't have any financial disclosure. So why this uh, 3D modeling? Because the COVID has disrupted mm -hmm. the physical learning process as well as computer simulation has been a part of this whole learning process as we know. But conventional modeling comes with a costly, it's a copyrighted discourse. So the hypothesis is cornea has a known uh, geometrical anatomy, known layers. So we tried to make a 3D model. Our objectives are to make a feasible model, a reproducible model, where the tissue properties and disease modeling can be done, and a different uh, a surgical step discussion also can be done. So this journey of 3D modeling this is a concept paper. So this journey of 3D modeling is uh, the crux of the whole story. So how do we start? We start with the best plate. This is the best plate. And we go around this axis and make the whole semicircle going around the same axis to form a hemisphere. Now the spherical cornea, we, uh, we constructed a very spherical cornea. All these are done on the uh, paint software on iPad. Cornea extrapolated from the spherical cross sections. All the semicircles are same in size and 3D rendered. So now the come, uh, question of primary curve and the secondary curve. So if we have two best plates and we construct two spheres, probably these spheres are going to intersect at some point of time. And if we remove this uh, intervening part, it will con consider to be a blend surface. The blend surface is this part. This one is the blend. This is the base plate drawing. So base plate drawings on a 3D model, solid works. Primary 2D drawing, the primary base plate. This is the primary base plate. There's a secondary base plate. And the primary diameter would be five millimeter and the secondary diameter would be seven millimeter. There, here is the blend. Now, uh, now there, there are different types of extrusion on 3D modeling. There is a cylinder on cylinder extrusion where we uh, form the primary cylinder and the secondary cylinder over that and we can extrude the final surface to be circular. And we can also do a sphere on cylinder. So the sphere and cylinder, what, is the re what do they represent? They represent particular layers of the cornea as we discuss. So layering after 2D image is again a paint image. So if we can think of a sandwich, so three layered sandwich, and all the layers will have some kind of adhesive properties in between them. These adhesive properties can be implied on them and you know we can uh, simulate different disease or patho normal physiological processes. And now if we can mold the sandwich into a spherical area, it will uh, almost learn to a uh, cornea. Coming to the materials and method, this is a concept paper so basically we had only nine PGTs and four seniors, given some normal 2D pictures and some given 3D models. 10 hours as uh, for uh, all simulations, hours are important. Post learning multiple response method we have used. So multiple response method is a proxy method. We social research method is a pilot project. Semi-quantitative and multiple regression analysis have done. Parameters could be uh, acceptance, simulations, reproduction and shareability. So the results are we are trying to uh, compare the uh, conventional 2D images of the books or uh, PDFs or whatever we find. And uh, with the 3D models, we are sh sharing on different platforms with the uh, persons in the nine PGTs and four seniors. So the acceptance level is definitely quite high because it is shareable. And if we go on to the simulation part, we'll see that the primary acceptance level is quite low. But as the cumulative frequency goes up, the acceptance is uh, more, the simulation is getting more accepted with time. Now this reproducible learning, is this reproducible or not? The cumulative frequency shows that it is reproducible in case of five. Now this is a pilot project, this just gives a crude idea. 
and shareability definitely it's shareable um, uh, across the platforms the discussions would be that uh, the models are accepted over hours and pilot proves prospective terms for the same comparison with conventional modeling like drawing oral lectures and observational learning is required because uh, just making a model uh, making a 3d model is already available uh, although it's a, a marketed model but we need to have a, we want to have a free model and then whether the acceptance of free model is there or not it's more a srm social research method but we need to find out that we tried to find out that acceptance can be graded with controls software needs upgradation on dynamic modeling this is again a part of discussion as the uh, whatever i have shown is a static modeling so a dynamic modeling is when you apply force a surgical force on the cornea it gets tend to get uh, deformed now if the model simulates the deformation it will be a dynamic modeling we need to incorporate that part into our model application better be tried a participants mostly used over mobiles this is again a factor because uh, mobiles doesn't give you a equivalent platform for all the participants it, it has to have same software has to have same android or same ios platforms layers can be uh, you know microscopic properties can be modeled within the layers additions differ in strengths and uh, the cheese separation technique can be used so the layers the cheese uh, can be molded into a spherical layer as well they can be compressed and they can be uh, distracted from one another printing on nozzle technique can be considered uh, with the pdms but uh, bioprint can also be available can also be made available 3d modeling on cornea is quite effective the conclusion would be versions to be better this is just a version probably 0.1 it is quite a new arena and a bright zone to improve on the qualitative learning and assistive learning this is my bibliography and thank you uh, thank you dr ghosh uh, just to be on the lighter side i think uh, to design something as complex as this you need to be a person good in physics chemistry artist sculpture uh, and so many other things i think uh, you managed to do all of them any uh, sir you would like to ask any questions uh, is it a real uh, thing or a hypothetical one meaning to say it is a more molded uh, ready to use one or it is just a hypothetical uh, sir uh, there's a whole process i mean a whole project going on hmm. this is just a part of the project the hmm. first version it's a, a simulated 3d version over the software the next version it can be 3d printed printed now this 3d print can be an artificial print can be a bioprint so the first the model acceptance of the model then bioprinting the artificial printing then uh, artificial printing pdma structures different layers and then uh, probably bioprinting and bioprinting over a fixatives so it could be fixed and can we simulate the ac2 that's the whole idea sir what is the advantage with your uh, uh, proposition you know so the idea is uh, if uh, like we can, we are scanning the patient we are seeing the patient yes. before we operate on a patient uh, we are taking the simple cataract surgery so we see the patient we simulate the patient we practice the surgery then we go to the original surgery this is the basic idea and we try to uh, this is not this is not going to be acceptable with conventional mode of teaching yes. so we are want to introduce into the learning process for the pgs for whoever learning a surgery then if accepted then it can be done in a personalized surgery like we are having personalized medicine why can't we have a personalized surgery but for having a personalized surgery we need to simulate that only after the simulation we can tell okay this is going to be my complication so i need to be very worrisome or i need to be very uh, cautious about this complication this is the basic idea sir okay you yeah, forgive my ignorance but i still fail to contemplate what you're saying here uh, how does it exactly help the surgical practice because you're doing it with the help of a software yes so sir if it is printable if you have a whole tree mod 3d model with you yes, then maybe you can you can actually do it yes but when you have eyes hmm. that present you a coronal picture of the whole thing then how does the 3d model differ i mean what are you trying to teach your your post graduates based on that 3d model i i still don't understand how is it going to for understanding identifying layers understanding the elevation maps it's superb hmm. no questions asked and i really like the originality of the concept but how does it actually help the surgical training is where i'm missing the hint so it's a dynamic modeling like in my uh, discussion part i have mentioned a limitation it has to be a dynamic modeling so as i go through the my stylus it creates an incision over the cornea now the cornea is getting breached 
so the model will accommodate the breach it will show off the layers now if it is suppose uh, it's an early entry or a, a delayed scleral entry now how will the cornea uh, uh, behave in both the cases it can be simulated over the 3d modeling now when a the learner is doing the surgery on a live eye and on a 3d model eye when it's a dynamic modeling he is going into and making the incision making the faults there and understanding okay cornea uh, somehow uh, you know behaves like this in fact this is an idea taken from the robotic surgeries in all other streams robotic surgery is coming and distance surgeries is coming but distance surgeries have been already tried but in i distance surgery has to be very fine so all the layers have to be perfect that's why we are trying to have a 3d model where the dynamic model can show us the deformation the changes as we apply force or as we apply cut or surgical incisions over a tissue that's what we are trying to model it's a dynamic modeling this is just the first part of the whole project sir it okay. not akin to the simulations no sir it not is just not just not a simulation the dynamic modeling is more than a simulation so if we can model how a cornea or how a tissue is going to behave when exposed to an external force then only we can like bioprint we have already bioprinted corneas we have bioprinted uh, uh, scleral layers we have bioprinted capsules the uh, the lens capsules but what we lack there th there is a simple series of cells but the series of cells are just not for there with the uh, simple adhesions there are so many uh, ion channels there are different adhesive molecules are there so exact uh, bioprinted cornea doesn't uh, uh, you know act like a normal cornea because we miss those adhesive properties we miss those typical tissue properties these are macro properties these are not micro properties so we are trying to make a three dimensional model where this macro properties will be simulated or emulated too so that a uh, model would be so perfect that it can actually simulate the tissue properties of perfect cornea while giving such an incision this is a distant dream probably version 10 or version 12 will be like that but the basic idea is to reach there and we started with simple cataract surgery simple corneal incision rather leave cataract surgery sir simple corneal incision can we emulate the tissue properties the resistance we are feeling in the cornea can we show that while we practice the simple scalpel scalpel scratch over a 3d corneal model corneal properties if you have an incision say placed to the wrong wrong plane yes sir or if it's not a trip tri triplanar mm. of or the length of the tunnel is short or long mm. whatever it is the properties actually change or inflict on the clinical uh, or clinical manifestations come in after they heal they do not produce an immediate change in the structural property how of the cornea how much force in a cornea would produce a, a, a early entry how much force or where the force has been applied the amount of force and the uh, place of force that we want to emulate this is going to give you a wrong incision a wrong entry on the, that particular cornea or not each and every cornea on that patient's cornea this incision at this point of okay, time okay so you mean that you would you would have a 3d graphical representation of each exactly individual sir, exactly sir exactly oh, personified surgery that's yes. interesting yeah. and nothing to do with the hysteresis no said so there are so many properties i am just this my presentation is just from the concept paper mm. so a corneal property can be on different lines mm. it can be static property it can be dynamic property it can yes. be asocity it can be hysteresis there are different diagnostic properties what is problematic is that they, it has to be wholesome at least 90% of the normal cornea yes. that's what we are trying sir okay so what uh, we could probably understand is that you can have a dynamic uh, simulation of in most of the cases a normal cornea to an external force how it behaves yes, but when you are operating each cornea each set of structures is totally different exactly sir so it is uh, the possibilities are infinite exactly sir and how would you plan to create such an infinite possibilities in sir we are using a something uh, yes, very sir, very we are, difficult we are to using comprehend a, because uh, you can probably in maybe 70 60 percent of the cases where most of the corneas behave in a typical fashion maybe this dynamic uh, simulation would work out but there are many set of cases where probably you know it really doesn't uh, act according to what we expect and you'll also the situations have to, are different yeah you'll also have to find out a way how to extrapolate the exactly. quantified 
real time force exactly, into the quantified exactly, virtual force so yes. how would you tell your uh, tell your student that this is the amount of force the force is not measurable you are entering with a blade so the stylus the st we have tried to uh, graduate titrate a stylus with the amount of force on a particular screen so a particular software a particular base with a particular stylus that gives you the amount of force in the direction of the force and the back like like we have a display on the uh, feco machine so the, this is the amount of force so on the amount of stylus uh, as in normally the touch screens work like that they give no, no. on the virtual platform what you're saying is fine but when the hand actually moves in you don't have a stylus there yes sir this so is you have to do a, a lot problem. of work there but definitely as problem. sir has pointed out the potential is quite immense and the manifestation we are trying to have a predictability model there are so many predictability softwares through ai we are working on that the predictability models sir right thank you my pleasure sir thank you dr ghosh the second presenter would be dr nikhil balakrishnan <coughs> and he <coughs> will be talking to us on baseball bat sign predicting prevalence of intra floppy eye syndrome in patients on tamsulosin uh good evening everyone uh, my topic for today is baseball's bat sign predicting the prevalence of intraoperative floppy iris syndrome in patients on tamsulosin i have no financial interest <clears throat> we all know that benign prosthetic hyperplasia is a common prevalence in elderly male age group uh, the treatment for the same is in the form of alpha blockers which help in relaxation of the smooth muscle of the prostate but because of this a side effect of the same is that the the receptors which are there on the dilator pupillae are also acted upon because of which we have something called the intraoperative floppy iris syndrome uh, it has already been published by dr chang et al that this includes insufficient pupillary dilation and undilated and billowed iris iris prolapsing into the wounds and progressive intraop pupillary constriction so uh, but we do not know that how many patients actually suffer from iris patients who are already on tamsulosin various studies showed studies showed different percentages of ifis first one 1.6 here 35% and here 14% so our research question is that is there a method to predict the occurrence of ifis in patients on tamsulosin so our materials and methods were well, it's a case control study uh, a test group of 76 eyes patients on tamsulin for, uh, tamsulosin for more than 3 months compared to a control group in 76 eyes in patients who are not on tamsulosin age of 55 years or above male patients only exclusion exclusion criteria so patients using other drugs besides tamsulosin for B bph uh, glaucomatous patients on agm a complicated cataract or any condition that could alter the iris pathology uh, pre operatively besides the routine cataract evaluation we did an undilated anterior segment oct and an infrared pupillometry for all the patients the oct helped us to see the iris structure and the pattern and the pupillometry helped us to assess the pupillary diameter under the photopic and scotopic lighting now in the iris measurements here we see this is the scleral spur the pupillary margin midway between the two exactly halfway is the dilator muscle receptors and 0.75 mm away from the pupillary margin is the sphincter muscle is the sphincter muscle region now in pupillary measurements we check the photopic and the scotopic pupil size using infrared technology uh, and then during the surgery we checked how many patients actually developed irifis any one of these three signs of the same so what were the results of our study uh, there was no difference in the age between the two groups now here comes the interesting fact uh, the dilator muscle region thickness in the test group was markedly reduced as compared to the control group uh, the sphincter muscle region thickness was similar in both the groups there was it was not significant and therefore there was an altered dmrt versus smrt ratio so here i am giving you i am showing an example of the same here you see the control group where the dmrt and the smrt are almost the similar thickness whereas here in the test group you would observe that the Uh, dilator muscle region thickness is markedly lesser than the sphincter muscle region thickness this is similar photos of the same of multiple patients so because of the striking resemblance of the iris of the patients on tamsulosin where the dilator muscle region thickness was reduced we coined the term baseball bat sign because it looked similar to a baseball bat 
Uh, similarly, we also found on pupil measurements that the photopic pupil size was lesser in patients on tamsulosin, and same with the scotopic pupil size. There was no significance in the ratio of the photopic to scotopic pupil size. Uh, so what was the results? We found that in the control group, there were no patients who developed any signs, in, signs of IFIS. In the test group, 62 out of the 76% uh, patients developed signs of IFIS, that it, out of which 63% uh, had floppy iris, 36 had iris prolapsing into the wounds, and 75 had intrapupillary constriction. So how do we ha what is the conclusion of the study? Use of the baseball, ba baseball bat sign on the anterior segment OCT is a reliable tool to detect the occurrence of IFIS in patients on tamsulosin. Our study adds that the use of anterior segment OCT for predicting, uh, helps the use of anterior uh, segment OCT for predicting the occurrence of iris. It was the first study to demonstrate that the thinning of the DMR thickness in patients on tamsulosin, and hence we coined the term baseball sign, and demonstration of inadequate pupillary or dilation in patients on tamsulosin using infrared pupillometry. So how do we translate the science into our clinics? When we know that these patients are going to suffer from IFIS intraoperatively, we, take, we are better prepared to tackle it by creation of longer wounds, controlled hydrodissection, avoid overfilling the chamber with viscoelastic, decompressing the anterior chamber periodically during the surgery, and doing a low-flow FACO. What are the futuristic approach to overcome the limitations of my study? Finding a method to correlate how the iris measurements with anterior segment OCT would represent the real iris thickness. And if we could do human cadaveric studies to corroborate the iris dilator muscle region smooth muscle tone deficiency in patients on tamsulosin. Thank you. Uh, very nice observation. Uh, I have one question to ask you. Yes, sir. What was the duration of uh, tamsulosin before these signs developed? Uh, so because there are some reports to suggest that uh, even a single, single dose, dose of tamsulosin Yes, can still, uh, even if you have stopped it years back, it can still go ahead and produce uh, IFIS. So, uh, uh, so we've, um, we have kept the, in the inclusion criteria, the patient had to be minimally on three months on tamsulosin. Only those patients were considered as a part of the test group. So uh, was there any correlation between the duration of uh, beyond three months? Say, uh, how many patients who were taken for three months and somebody who was taken for nine months or so? No, sir. We, we haven't uh, subdivided it individually into the time period in which the patient was consuming uh, tamsulosin. Because this is something like an anatomical change happening. Yes, sir. It takes some time to happen. Yes, sir. So uh, we, it probably cannot explain the cases which uh, still go to IFIS on a very short-term therapy. Okay. And also, is there any correlation that 50% uh, thickness would show up with many say, signs and introp uh, problems as uh, compared no, so to uh, 60 or 70%? So, sir, uh, we didn't find that there was a 50. It was around about three-fourth of the thickness of the uh, muscle was reduced in that. Uh, we, we, although there was a varying uh, things, it was, it was around about 75% of the thickness. That's three-fourth of the thickness is what we found. Very rarely did we find it going as low. The lowest value, I think, which we found was somewhere around about 68% or something of that sort. So we, because it was, clo it was closely grouped and it was not scattered, we did not compare it individually to uh, like the percentage of it reduced to the actual signs which were happening on table. But indirectly, you can uh, assume that the more the th thinness, thickness yes, is sir, reduced, the, yes, the sir, definitely. effects are more. Uh, yes, sir. I'll ask you the reverse of the essence of your study. How many patients were on damsulosin and you did not find a baseball bat sign in them? Uh, how many, how many patients, patients you saw were on tamsulosin for more than three months, but you did not find a baseball bat sign in them? So, sir, uh, our study had a test group of, 70, of, of 76 eyes, out of which there were, I think, four eyes where we did not find the baseball sign at all uh, in that. So you're because saying, we considered the baseball uh, baseball bat sign as 75 percent redu reduction, so if it was above 75 percent, so there were just four patients who did not have the reduction being at least 75 yeah, percent. That's okay, but how did those four patients behave on table? So uh, correlationally on table, they did they did also have some signs of IFIS, but they did not have 
the uh, there were mostly the early signs of IFS, like there was an undulated uh, iris, there was the billowing of the iris, but we did not see their uh, iris actually prolapsing into the wounds in those cases. So maybe early signs of iris, like uh, not the non-dilation of the pupil were there even in them, but it was not, uh, it was the, the, uh, the later signs of IFS where the, the pupil, the iris actually co comes into the wounds and prolapses into the wounds were not observed in those patients. And you're saying that out of the 736 uh, patients that were included? Yes, sir. Uh, 16 on eyes also did not have much of a sign of IFS on the table? Yes, sir. So how do you, I mean, the, the reason I'm asking this is, you said that the, the objective of your study is to find out these signs, I mean, this sign, in Correct. singular, so that it, it saves you from all the uh, hardships that you have to face as a surgeon yes. on the table. But despite of you finding out that sign, and in those 76 patients, 64 of them, which is a significantly high number, did show signs of IFS. So what are we, I mean, even if you find out that sign pre-op, we did have our difficulties on the table. We did have signs of IFS. So, what does it suggest? Correct. So, sir, in this study, what we did was that when we found out that the patient had the sign, we haven't used it intraoperatively there. We haven't, we haven't taken measures. We've gone ahead with a normal phaco emulsification. We've correlated it later. So, what was done is it was the, the surgeon who was operating. At the time when he was operating, wasn't told that, you know, this patient has uh, the baseball bat sign. The correlation was done on a later basis. First, the the anterior segment OCT was done as a routine preoperative examination and intraoperatively the surgeon operated the case as he was normally operating any other case. Postoperative, when we did the entire study, we correlated both of them and we that's how we found out that these are the patients because they had the decrease in the dilator muscle receptor thickness. We found that all of these patients who had these decrees showed some or the other sign of the IFS, either be the early stages or be the later stages, but they did show some or the other sign. So hence we propose that if we come now retrospectively, if we look back, we know that if this patient shows such a sign on the anterior segment OCT, we definitely can say that he will show one of the signs of IFS intraoperatively. Somewhere I saw the figures you mentioned was 81.56. Yes, sir. So that was, um, can I? So did the surgeon know that these patients are on tantalus? Yes, sir. He, he, the patient knew, the patient, the surgeon knew as a normal listing that the patients are on tantalusin. But he did not know anything about the anterior. The, any so findings that's okay. The, but the surgeon did know that these patients are on tamsulosin for more than three months. So the yes. possibility of IFS is there. No. So the even then, the the surgeon because here it was it was a blind study. The patient the, 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 the surgeon did not know which patients were in the control group and did not know which patients. No, no I'm were not in the, talking were, about. I'm just taking it beyond your study. If the surgeon knows that there is a chance of IFS happening. And now the surgeon knows that there is a baseball bat sign. Yes. What would be on the on the uh, on the business end of things? How would it change? I mean, I know that this patient is likely to have IFS. Yes. Yet this patient did show signs of IFS. Correct. I know that this patient has a baseball bat sign. Yes. Sir. And I take this patient up on, onto the OT table. What would my approach? How would my approach change? Correct. And what should I do extra? If I, if I know that this patient has a baseball, what do you propose on that front? So, sir, what I would propose on this front is that the surgeon be extra cautious. You know that you're going to, it's a challenging case which you're going to take up right now. You know that there is going to be some signs of floppy iris during the surgery. So, so that so is what I'm this make patient, a longer, this surgeon also knew. Uh, no, this surgeon did not know uh, preoperatively. As I said, it was a blind study. He did not know that the patient was on tamsulosin at all. It's a blinded study. It was a blind study. Like I said, I think you said yes to that. So I asked this question. So it was, a, as I said, it was a blind study. So the, the surgeon did not know did that not the patient know is that, on tamsulosin. Yes, correct. And now by knowing this, he takes extra precautions. He makes a longer tunnel while doing his hydro dissection. He's more careful because the, uh, there can be a raised pressure during that time. Uh, he uses. He constantly deflates the anterior chamber repeatedly so that the viscoelastic is brought out. He does all he can from his end to make sure if there is a, a constricted pupil, he uses some kind of mechanically pupil dilators to make sure that the pupil is well dilated if, if yeah. needed. The so, point, this is what I wanted to yes, highlight. Sir. The 81 percent is a yes, significant sir. number. Yes, sir. So meaning to say that baseball sign is present in almost 80 percent beyond that. Am yes, I right? Sir. 
so that would be a predictive high predictive value yes, as sir. far as the uh, manifestation yes, in that also the pupillary uh, thing which you have quoted is around 75% correct sir so you could further study on with this thickness and this manifestation uh, which would be more affected say for this is a correlation between the thickness and this uh, pupillary signs correct you could uh, f- f- figure out 60% there's a risk 50% is there's no risk something like that yes sir so that you could further carry on with it definitely thank you thank you sir i would also probably extend the scope of this study to other drugs like uh, naftopidil yes uh, sir which are also known to cause uh, ifs correct yes sir majority of the patients nowadays are on tamsulosin so we could get a larger study group uh, yeah. we did try to include first all of them but we found that other there were very few patients uh, yeah. in single digits who were on other uh, this thing besides yeah, probably uh, that would give us an insight into uh, why this baseball baseball sign is happening exactly. yes sir Thank we you. all know that Thank histopathologically the dilatum muscle atrophies and the sarcomeres are just not of their normal volume but it's a beautiful thought that uh, somebody could image that and find out that this actually being swollen at the tip so yeah definitely well thank you sir nice uh, we go on to the third paper by dr paneer selvam uh, results of novel cmt plex so iod for epic is uh, madan gopal sir Pani Selvam is a co-author. Yeah, Madan Gopal. Yeah. I'm sorry. Co-authors. Uh, <coughs> it's scleral fixated eye oil and iris claw eye oil. Dr. Madan Gopal. Yeah. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, I'll be speaking about the results of the novel CMT flex lens in comparison with the standard uh, scleral fixated lens and the iris claw lens. So I have no financial disclosures, whereas my good friend uh, Dr. Nivian is the innovator and the patent holder for this lens. So a little background about the subject. We know that when there is a posterior capsular compromise, surgeons fall back on two standard options, that is the uh, scleral fixated eye oil or the iris claw lens. Now each of them have their own advantages and disadvantages. The advantage of an SFI oil is that it's in a more anatomically correct position. You don't disturb an important tissue like the iris. But the disadvantage is that the surgery is relatively long. It's time consuming. It requires a learning curve. On the other hand, an uh, iris claw lens is a relatively simple surgery. But on the flip side, uh, it, you're anchoring the lens to an important tissue like the iris. So there is uh, a chance for you know, pupillary distortion or a little anti-segment inflammation. So this is where the CMT flex lens was developed. We tried to mix and match. We tried to retain the advantages of both while eliminating the disadvantages. Retaining the advantages uh, by which I mean, you know, the, the surgery is kept uh, as a simple surgery, whereas anchoring to the iris is eliminated. The anchoring remains to the sclera, so your pupil distortion is uh, eliminated or intraocular inflammation is eliminated. Now, we presented the design of this lens, the dimensions of the T, the vault uh, of the optic, uh, the case reports. We presented it in standard international journals. There have been a lot of acceptance. Uh, we've received a lot of acclaim in conferences where the videos were played. We've had people coming up to us and telling, no, we'll be very happy to try the lens. But the question always asked was, how does it compare with the standard options? How does it compare head on head with SFIOLs and iris claw lenses? So that was precisely the aim of this particular study. We wanted to find the visual and refractive outcomes of the CMT flex lens and compare it with the standards. And more importantly, we also wanted to see whether the undesirable effects are also comparable. So how was the study done? It was done in two tertiary eye care uh, hospitals in Tamil Nadu. It was prospective, non-randomized for the simple reason that you know it's difficult to randomize uh, surgical aphakia. Uh, <clears throat> we had strict inclusion criteria. We took up only patients with surgical aphakia. Uh, for a period of three months, we had 112 eyes. We lost about 39 of them to follow up. So we had 73 eyes in all, and they fell into three groups like this. Uh, so these are all published uh, uh, techniques. So I'm, uh, for the sake of brevity, I'm not going to, going to go into the details of the technique or how it's uh, exteriorized. But suffice to say that this is a hydrophilic uh, single piece lens which has a T-shaped haptic and handshake technique is used to exteriorize the haptic and anchor it, anchor it to the sclera. So moving on to the results, what were the numbers that we found? I'm not going to go into you know complex decimals or uh, statistical uh, analysis, but I'll show you what the data actually means. Now these are the three groups. We found that there is no difference uh, in the three groups on the basis of age, gender, axial length, or eye power. 
But we did see that, you know, the time between the first and second surgery was significantly lesser in the iris claw group. And of course, the iris claw patients had uh, fewer patients with lenticular remnants that required a pass plan or vitrectomy. Now, coming to duration of surgery, of course, iris claw lens surgery was significantly shorter in duration. And one patient with an SFIO required resurgery. When it comes to refractive error, we saw that iris claw lenses had a significantly higher hypermetropic shift, and in visual acuity, all three lenses were similar. And that is seen in uh, these box whisker plots showing hyperopic shift in the ICL and uh, best corrected visual acuity wise at one month and at six months. You know, bo both all the three groups were similar. Now I come to the more important part of uh, the you know undesirable effects. We saw that corneal edema or uh, IOL dislocation or vitreous haze were similar in all the three groups. Whereas when I talk about AC reaction, irregular pupil or IOL tilt, of course the iris claw lenses were noted to be significant, significantly higher. And uh, there was haptic exposure in a couple of patients with the standard scleral fixated lens. So to discuss this, I mean, a few of uh, the points thrown up by our study were already well known. We know that iris claw lenses surgery takes lesser time. Um, the visual results are similar. Iris claw lenses probably distort the pupil more, have a little bit of inflammation. But what our study adds is that the CMT flex lens is comparable to both of these lenses uh, based on the visual outcome and better than the iris claw lens as far as the refractive outcome is concerned. And importantly, I keep stressing on this, importantly, the complication profile is also very, very similar to the standard options. Of course, we had a few limitations of our study. The sample size was small. Uh, it couldn't be randomized simply because surgical effect, yeah, some uh, surgeons preferred to you know, complete the procedure then and there, uh, and we had a shorter period of follow-up. Nevertheless, we were able to derive certain valuable conclusions from our study. We were able to show that the CMT flex lens in comparison with the SFIO and iris claw lens, it's, it has similar visual outcomes and better refractive outcomes than the iris claw lens. Uh, when both the scleral fixator, that is the standard scleral fixator and the CMT flex lens are, are compared head on head, we see that CMT flex lens has lesser haptic exposure. And when I talk about complication profiles like inflammation and pupil distortion, we see that CMT flex is very, very comparable to the standard SFIO and really better than the iris claw lens. Thank you for the opportunity and time. Uh, do you think an attempt to measure the endothelial cell count would have been uh, an additional help? It could, it could. Because I didn't see that. Uh, we did not, so it, uh, that could be added, definitely. So also, was there any attempt made to measure the white to white? Yes, sir. Uh, every patient has a white to white measure in the IOL master. And uh, this lens comes in a standard size. Yes. Uh, it's of 13 to 13.5 millimeter, if I'm right. I, I just forgot the dimensions. But you see that U shaped uh, haptic, the base of the haptic, sir. That allows for, you know, uh, wi bigger white to white uh, dimensions as well. So, meaning to say, only if you know that, you can precise really, the position not really. on the both the sides. Uh, in not really. In the sir. sense, this one stem may be uh, longer and the other side, the other side a shorter stem. So how do you, uh, you know? Stem of the IOL? Uh, no, the, the haptic, the extra is haptic. They are of similar size, sir, on both sides. No, no, no. no. There may be m more exposure on one side as compared to the other side. If you're not uh, really equating from white to white and the port. And oh, I see. Thing. Oh, you're talking about uh, the exteriorization yes, part. Yes, we exteriorize yes. it 1.5 mm behind the limbus, sir, on both sides, equally. I think what he, what he meant was if it's a large eye and you said that the U, the fenestration in the haptic is adjusting or accommodating it for the accord. pull. Yes. Mm. What he means is it pulls the lens and maybe just elongates a little bit, elongates it. So it might just have repercussions as far as the shape of the lens is concerned. Uh, I was very, I was a little uh, taken aback when you said the iris claw IOLs did have a hypermetropic residual refractive error. What I have seen in my practice is it's the converse of that. They actually have a myopic uh, residual error more. The reason for that is the power adjustment when it's done, when it's, it's yes. done wrongly because their A constant is very low. And also that it sits more anteriorly, even right. in front of the sulcus, where the sulcus would be. So further subtraction has to be done right. on the IL power, which normally surgeons in the heat of the moment we don't, uh, do. don't do. In fact, this study helped us refine our iris claw practice as well. And uh, I'm also not surprised to see that you did find uh, nuclear remnants in iris claw IOL patients because mostly they're done by anterior segment, anterior segment poor right. surgeons like us. So 
Once you have a complication, you just panic and the pupil comes down on you. Um, one, of the, one of the red flags when it comes to posterior fixation of iris claw is, achha, I just wanted to know the figure. How many of your FA kicks were post-vitrectomized eyes? Uh, none of them were vitrectomized at the point of inclusion, sir. Uh, actually, how this works is that if the primary surgeon feels that he can place an iris claw then and there, if he's got no nuclear then he goes ahead and places it. If not, every case comes to the vitreoretinal surgeon. So we will do a complete vitrectomy, remove the nuclear remnants of any, and then place the IOL. So to answer your question directly, were the eyes vitrectomized before the second surgery or before the IOL was placed? No. None of them? None of them. I mean, uh, not before they came onto the table. So vitrectomy was done on table. Yeah, and then that's the what IOL. I'm saying. I mean, fine. I mean, you, now you tend to evaluate the patients when their eyes have been vitrectomized, right? Yes. So the reason why I'm asking this is the flutter of the iris in post-vitrectomized eyes actually causes a lot of issues with the posterior fixation of the iris claw IOL. So I always send out a red flag to my fellow surgeons not to use an iris claw IOL if the patient is secondarily being done after vitrectomy because the iris flutter also tends to flutter the IOL. Absolutely. And sometimes the patients complain of a very strange oscillopsia. They say that they see they that the see vision, the, the image, the, the vision is clear, but it, it's kind of shaky. So since I see that the plate that you have at the end of the haptics obviously is exteriorized and then it opens up and occupies its position, that's what I understand from the design at the first look. That's right. On the sclera, if the eyes are vitrectomized, the iris flutters. Along with that, it must be having the iris has to have some kind of bang effect on the IOL. Does it, in your experience, I don't know what's the follow-up schedule that you have in your study, has it really affected the location of the IOL? Does it not push it all. back or? Not at all, not at all. This looks like it's a hinged IOL and a two-point fixation. It actually is a four-point fixation because once the haptics come out, they anchor themselves really well to the sclera. You're coming out through a 25 gauge insulin, which is sub 1 mm, and the uh, the width of the haptic is also sub 1 mm, but the uh, T shape really anchors it well to the sclera and gives you a four point. What's, what's the width of that T? I really forgot, sir. At this point of time, I'm not able to remember, but it's, it is sub 1 mm. It is a little larger than the uh, 23 bore, the bore of the 23 needle. So it sits so in perfectly. It, it sits perfectly at the outset, but what I meant was if there is a the mechanical oscar, movement, yeah, since it's a hydrophilic design, you said, yes. it's a very soft material. Right. So it just might slip back or, you know, because the plate is the plate is there and I can completely understand that it's flared and it anchors it well. But there could be a bit of sagging inside the wound since it's hydrophilic and the material of hydrophilic lenses, generally speaking, are very soft. So. Right. Uh, maybe a long-term study could be done. Definitely, too. so definitely. It's in the very world. interesting design, I must say. And yeah, the rest of the things were fine. Yeah, I was to also ask the same point. It is more malleable and soft. Right. Unlike those rigid ones which you are going to extrazise in the yes, Gabo right, right, tunnel. Right, right. They are, you know, strongly fixed. But there is a possibility that there may be some, you know, in the long run, some laxity or something. Uh, so far, we have not, not had any. So it's like, you know, uh, our regular single piece hydrophilic lenses in but the bag. mind you they are sitting in the uh, bag yes, snugly yes. fitted but right. here only the two point fixation and a soft difference. material right there's a chance that there could be some sort of uh, so flexibility not seen there. any so far no, some sort but of a flexibility as i said we'll yes. have to yeah, look at it for a uh, long period of five watch years watch out for it in the yeah. future yes thank you thank you we go on to our final paper by dr narin shetty Thank you all for the opportunity. Um, so today I'll be talking about predicting preoperative biomarkers for uh, exaggerated retinal pathologies post cataract surgery. This is not the one. This is not the one you need to present. Yeah. The other one. Oh, the other the one? 3D. Yeah, the 3D wala. This one? Yes. Correct. All right. So I'm changing my topic. 
So I'll be talking about 3D visualization system. Um, now, microscope has uh, evolved over the time, and we, we, we keep wondering whether we progressed or regressed. <laughs> so this is where, uh, in 2018, the 3D visualization system came into picture, which is uh, called the Ingenuity. We, and uh, we took this because, or we adopted this, to take care of three people. One, the doctors. The next, the patients. The next, the trainees. Now, coming to the doctors, uh, as you all know, it's been an occupational hazard of, you know, uh, ophthalmologists to have neck pain and back pain, and it's become a big issue. Uh, especially if you're training the trainees, you end up sitting in a very awkward position where you're, uh, because of the bed height and the microscope height is not matching, and you end up with a lot of pain by the time you finish training. But with the coming of the 3D microscope, you can see me, you know, you can really relax your back uh, on the chair uh, behind and then look at the screen and operate. And the training is even better. You can stand anywhere in the OT, don't, you don't have to sit also, look at the screen and train the trainees. The next thing is, how do we take care of our patients? As you all know, 3D system, we use uh, low illumination because of which the patients are so much more comfortable. Eventually, they cooperate, uh, they cooperate more and eventually uh, surgical outcome also is more. And this is 5% illumination, which is amazing operating at that low illumination. The next thing is uh, taking care of our trainees. It's been a really boon for trainees and it has really shortened the learning curve. And as you all know, uh, the side viewing of a microscope, you're limited to one or two uh, you know, trainees looking through it. But with 3D system, no matter how many people are there, you can just wear a th cheap 3D glasses, look at the screen, and uh, you're good to go. And, and it doesn't matter whether you're just a, a, a fellow who's just joined or a senior fellow, from day one, uh, you can look at the depth perception. That way, you pick up things really, really quickly. So I just want to show a series of cases uh, using the 3D microscope. This is a soft cataract. And uh, yes, you can chop every soft cataract. It is extremely easy. Uh, uh, th this is a dialer which I designed myself. Uh, so with this, uh, chopping is extremely, extremely easy. The, the technique is you need to do it slowly and also uh, do not rush it because then it'll start cheese wiring. Now, obviously, uh, chopping in a softer cataract is much, I mean, uh, NS1, NS2 and above is much easier. Uh, the key is whenever you get a good hold in the FACO tip, please do not uh, move it or push it. Uh, th that way you prevent hydrogenic uh, zonula breaks. Even doing a uh, rexus on an, uh, in an intermittent case is uh, extremely easy. Uh, in fact, this is one of my first cases and, uh, you know, uh, usually I create a smaller rexus in the beginning and then I extend it so that I prevent you know, these kind of runaways. So here you can see even the viscoelastin being washed from the endothelium. Uh, that is the beauty and the clarity of uh, the ingenuity. And this is actually a zoomed out uh, video of the same. Here you can see me polishing the posterior capsule. And for a, just a microsecond, I hold the posterior capsule and release it. Uh, and let's look closely at the same. See, you can, you can see me holding, uh, you know, the, the capsule is held within the aspiration cannula and you can see the spidering of the capsule. This, but I release it. This can happen only if the, there is no lag in the system. If what is happening in reality is exactly, you know, uh, what you see in the screen, then only the reflex is good and you prevent the complication. So here's a black cataract, uh, you know, even doing a, uh, you know, a surgery on a black cataract is extremely easy. Uh, uh, the key point is uh, whenever you're doing quadrant removal, always uh, place the phaco tip in the center. Do not shake it when you're pressing step three. And I always remove my side, uh, second instrument so that it uh, creates a better fluidics within the eye. So we did a study where we compared the, uh, the Ingenuity system or the 3D system with the standard operating microscope. Uh, this was a prospective randomized uh, uh, study where we had 224 uh, patients and five uh, surgeons. We looked at the ease of visualization of uh, the different steps of FACO surgery and also post-operative outcomes. This was how the scoring uh, uh, looked like, which was given to the surgeon. And when we look at the uh, results, uh, the, uh, the doctors had much more discomfort when they were operating on a standard operating microscope. And they operated on a, a very low brightness and illumination on a 3D system or an Ingenuity system, uh, which is amazing. And, uh, you, uh, you know, overall, uh, the patients also were very comfortable. When you look at the post-operative first day AC cells and flare, there's no significant difference between the two groups. And uh, when we look at the ease of visualization of the different steps of uh, cataract surgery, there was no significant 
uh, uh, there's nothing significant between the two groups. And when we look at the subgroup of uh, metro cataracts also, uh, the results were, were quite, quite similar. So I'd like to conclude by saying the surgeon uh, was able to operate at a significantly lesser illumination and brightness with the 3D system. It provides better neck comfort and also significantly the patients were more comfortable and more cooperative using the Ingenuity and hands down a superior tool in training students. Thank you for your time. I just had uh, one uh, uh, small doubt whether this is uh, adaptable with any microscope or... Uh, uh, no, it depends on the company, sir. <laughs> Because the uh, kind they, of clarity which we are seeing is probably possible only with very high-end microscopes. Yeah, it, it, it all uh, depends on which uh, company you go with, sir. So depending on that, sometimes the uh, one company goes with their no, no, Ingenuity is compatible ingenuity with all microscopes. Yeah. But, but not the, the size. The size. Uh, yeah, yeah. It is compatible with size. But not the lo low end, they don't. The lowest end. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, Lumina Eye onwards, correct, they do correct. work. Sorry, no. That's the key. The but only issue right now is the cost. Costing is the issue, sir. But obviously, when you go up, the resolution would be better, the red glow would be better, and as he rightly pointed out, it can really go down on your elimination. Yes. But um, just an interesting, I mean, just an observation. The first two surgeries that you showed, Naren, were post-flax. Right, um, right, right. So any reason why you did not choose to do a nucleotomy with the flax machine? And um, Actually, in fact, I personally don't do it. Uh, don't do the nucleotomy because, see, I, I personally... You don't do the nucleotomy with flax ever? No, no I don't do it. That uh -huh. is because, see, for me, I feel if a patient is paying something, I shouldn't, at least uh, they're paying for a very premium surgery. And I don't want to add one more set of complications for him. So in the sense, at least in my hands, uh, you know, doing a regular chop or this, there's absolutely no difference. But when we do a lensectomy, especially in these hard cataracts, the bubbles itself, you know, I've had cases with that itself has led to a PCR. So it's extremely, you know, I mean, I don't want to add that 1% or 2% risk of, uh, you know, a PCR occurring just because there was excess bubbles and then uh, it led to a PCR. I mean, it, you feel like you feel bad that it's not happened in your hands. It's more because of the machine. But that's, that's one of the reasons why I don't do it. <laughs> But is there any need only with uh, the femto because there's no pixelization in this? Yeah. Right. To tell you the truth, sir. No. I mean, as you go on, you know, increasing the mag you know magnification, still the clarity is maintained. That is the beauty of the ingenuity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The zoom. So, will there be any need at all? As uh, he was also asking for the femto and other things, we could otherwise go do away with the regular things because you are seeing so better and clear. Uh, in the microscope or the ingenuity? System? No, with the ingenuity system. Uh, correct, sir. So what is it required, sir, you said? No. To go uh, He's uh, saying there's no need of uh, uh, flax uh, if yes. your visibility is so clear. So clear and, and so correct, correct. perfect. So the thing is, sir, uh, more than the clarity, I would say no matter what um, the machine is, finally the actual benefit of flax is the rexus, period. Not the incisions, not this. The main benefit of the precision and consistency of uh, the rexus is actually is ha it's because of the I mean rexus which the flags create. Usually the surgeons cannot create because nobody knows what is the center of the bag. No surgeon can predict that. We can approximate. Okay, this is the center or something. We can just do it. But what these uh, femto uh, machines do is they actually center it to the bag, which will be actual the centration where the lens also will happen. Yes. So that is the actual beauty and the huge benefit of uh, flags, that's my belief. Yeah. Uh, the rest of it is so minuscule, it really doesn't matter. With all In a, a surgeon's, I mean, skilled hand, definitely. With all humbleness, I would agree to disagree with you. I, to <laughs> me, the main crux of a flax procedure yeah. is the corneal application and not direct access because I found it to be extremely beneficial in my practice. Yeah. But we are digressing from the topic. Let's right, just come right, back. Okay. Uh, so you, you mentioned that you, on occasions or quite regularly, as we know all of you do, uh, right at your center, you, you handle a massive or fatty load of surgeries almost every day. So what's the percentage of 3D in the anterior segment, in cataract surgery, in phacoemulsification in particular, what's the percentage of 3D surgery uh, in your practice? Do you do all of them under 3D? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so when you, have, when you have 20 surgeries, just citing an example, 
at the end of those 20 surgeries, do you feel any strain on the eyes? Of your eyes, not the patient's eyes, your eyes. Not really, not really. Actually, that's part of the uh, study where we looked at the comfort from, you know, how uh, easy is to visualize or does he have any issues. They were extremely comfortable. All the reason surgeons. why I'm asking yeah. this to you is because the 3D technology is of two types. One is active and the other is passive right, 3D right, technology. Right. The active 3D technology actually switches off and switches on between the two right, eyes. Right. So it keeps on flickering. And the glasses that you use for the active 3D are powered par glasses. Passive, they have yeah. to be battery powered or battery charged. Mm -hmm. The glasses they give you with Ingenuity or Artevo are passive 3D passive glasses, ones. but yet they pixelate the picture. They layer them. You have around 300 layers for the left eye and 300 layers for the right eye. So at any point in time, you're actually seeing monofocal. And then the superimposition happens in the brain. So I had an issue because I have taken a demo for quite some time. And I did have issues after a long list for the day. I did have issues with the strain factor. So if had I been one of your respondents in your, uh, in your uh, questionnaire, right. I would have definitely not said that I'm very comfortable using, agree to the other points okay. though. But, and say in one out of hundreds, uh, hundred cases wherein you needed to switch back to the, have you ever had that? I'm, an, uh, I'm in a situation wherein you come back to the microscope view from the uh, from no, the no, absolutely engineer. not. I think in terms of doing the surgery, absolutely no difference. If any complication also there, uh, all the surgeons continued with the same. And plus answering to your first question, I think it's extremely important to see when we comparing two technology, obviously you cannot have that much of experience on a micro, I mean, as much as a microscope, but at least what we did is we didn't say, okay, start operating. We didn't ask the five surgeons or four surgeons to, okay, from today you operate in the 3D. So what were before the study, they, they were meant to, they were made to operate on the 3D system. So they get used to it because it's important, whatever it is, even a FACO, uh, FACO machine, you give it today an, uh, to an experienced surgeon and, uh, and uh, just one day or half a day experience, you say, okay, now you decide. Sometimes it's getting used to the system. Once we, once he keeps using on a daily basis, they come to one comfort level. Then we compare the two technologies. That's, that's how the study was done. So which, according to you, is the biggest advantage of this technology? The surgeon's comfort or teaching the uh, budding surgeons? Uh, both, no. both. If you I, have I to choose one if, of if them. If I have to choose uh, in terms of percentage-wise, training is even more. So have you ever asked, tried to ask one of your trainees which gives him better depth perception and understanding of the procedure? Watching it on screen oh. or watching it through the side scope? Absolutely, absolutely. No doubt only about it. Yeah. So they like hands down. There's like they they are like uh, uh, they never remove the three D screen. <laughs> That's what happens. The whole surgery they're just always wearing the three D screen, looking at the screen continuously. Where they have options because in the OT we have other TVs also. We have the video is coming in the Callisto or some other one more monitor which was there from long before. There also the video comes. But eventually everyone looks at this screen and then sees it. Because no, that's obvious because yeah. all the other monitors are 2D, even the, exactly, uh, the exactly. Calisto monitor. That's when you get the depth perception. Yeah. No, I was asking you, have you tried to compare from their perspective? Have you tried to compare it with the, the, the visualization of the video or the procedure or the steps through the side scope? Because that's also something that gives you three-dimensional viewing. Nothing, no technology can ever evolve so, which has a better 3D perception than human eyes. So, so what happens is, uh, see now if I'm operating, again seeing through that, they will break their neck and bone. There's no doubt only about it. He, he has to be my same height, same this, everything should be there because otherwise, you know, adjusting to that kind of a level and also there'll be a bend forward also. When you see a trainee or a, a person who's teaching or whoever seeing through the side wing, he'll never match the primary surgeon. So it's extremely difficult, extremely difficult on a long, actually if you, uh, today if we go home and uh, ask one of the fellows or trainees who you're training, uh, if they ask them like the whole day after they keep seeing through the side wing, how you're feeling, how's your neck and back, just ask one question. 
more than enough all the answers come in i obviously <laughs> is a i'm a stand alone practitioner so i don't have but i would seriously like dr paul to 100% because he trains a lot of on people the, we, so we can actually call now the, the call scope. and ask sir. how yes. does it compare sir i mean you must have had loads of it so do you really think that uh, no, your no, trainees no, have no, no, the trainees are definitely better enjoys and uh, they to see you know better than your uh, you know observer scope uh one uh, small uh, doubt which yes. i had uh does uh, the refractive error of the surgeons play any part in their comfort levels yes sir have you the, done anything to no definitely study? sir we have to correct the refractive power so he has to if no, the surgeon no even with the correction like somebody who is having say supposing minus 3 cylinder and somebody who is hematopic uh, their level of comfort are they com- comparable or I they mean, are different I personally haven't looked at it sir but uh, I mean uh, I mean thinking about it I mean it shouldn't make a difference because once we wear the glasses eventually we are all like zero uh, power eyes so it shouldn't make a difference sir but uh, one crucial thing is majority of our trainees are under stress so they eventually have they sometimes over accommodate and other things so we on a regular basis we keep checking their eyes to make sure that they're not because half the time they don't see and they keep operating so it's extremely important to you know sometimes if it's your focus and the trainee's focus is not matching send them to orthotics immediately <laughs> some surgeons use uh, monovision so <laughs> uh, it was would be seriously advisable to them to use their glasses and use their binocularity otherwise so you would not have so the same depth perception ever one other added advantage is that the assisting sisters even they have the feel of uh, oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah so that true, is also so an added so advantage yeah. thank you thank you so thank you thank you ben